Alrighty, so we just spent um, the last lecture talking about uh, different ecosystems all around the planet by latitude primarily, right? And except we didn't call them ecosystems, we called them biomes. So I don't know why. Uh, I had a minor in aquatic ecology. We didn't really have environmental science as a degree back in the late 80s, early 90s. It was probably a few places, but we all called it ecology, and you know, you can get an ecology degree or you could specialize your biology degree, da 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 da. But I, I don't know why now that we're changing gears, my point being, why when it's on land we call them biomes. And when we're in the water, they decide not to use the word biomes. I have, I have no idea. But they're all just, as we said, ecosystems. Uh, terrestrial ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems. Unlike the terrestrial ecosystems, we're not so much bound by latitude. Yeah, temperature certainly has a part to play, but um, it's, it's not quite as simple as just that. I guess. So, yeah, aquatic life zones. So as I just said, temperature is not as important. Uh, precipitation, well, you're already in the water. So what is important? Salinity. All right. How salty the water is or isn't. Uh, you should be familiar with the terms fresh water and salt water already. All right, but just a reminder, if you're inland, most of the places on the planet, there's a few exceptions, okay? But if you're looking at a pond or a river or a lake, you're freshwater. Uh, if you are in the oceans or the seas, you're salt water. And again, yes, there are a few inland large bodies of water that are saline, but as a general rule, salt water is oceans, Fresh water is inland, clearly. <clears throat> Have you heard of that place where it's like, oh, lake, um, well, um, like, uh, and then it's like, and then it like kind of merges into the part of the part of the ocean. It's like a bay would do that, but I don't know about a, a lake. I don't know. Like my my stepsister told me about it. It's like it's like green and all, and like, and then it and then it like kind of merges into like a bigger ocean. I'm like Okay. That's probably that sound correct. <laughs> but I'm gonna go with it. Uh, it might be so, we're gonna talk about something called an estuary or an estuarine environment. It's where fresh and salt merge. Oh. And okay. but usually it's not a lake per se, it's more like a, a river turns into a bay, turns into the ocean. So if the bay is enclosed enough, it could certainly look like a lake. But we'll see. Maybe something that we talk about today will uh, will be exactly what she's mentioning. So salinity, as we said, is the primary factor. We've also got things like dissolved oxygen, uh, which you guys have been messing with in lab, um, or will be messing with in lab. Uh, temperature is important, but not, as you see, the top of the list. pH, okay, uh, whether it's acidic or basic. Uh, and then what kind of water you're, you're living in, whether it's still water or a, um, a very wave-prone environment or somewhere where, like, say, a stream where there's a constant current, um, that is certainly important. Think about just, you know, if you were put in that situation um, where you were, in, you know, you'd probably want to live in somewhere where there's not a whole lot of current, a pond or a lake, right? Um, if you live in the, uh, the beach zone, just to use a simple word for a minute, you've constantly got those waves crashing over you, tumbling you around. Think about, again, if you've been lucky enough to be at the beach, all those seashells that you see rolling back and forth in there. Critters do live there, all right? I don't know uh, if I've ever seen a seashell roll, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, you watch next time. It'll, it moves. It slides, but uh, depending on how rough it is, it can roll, too. Um, those of you that fish in streams, all right, think about the fish that live in those streams. Unless they're going to hide behind a rock, they've got that water constantly 
flowing against them or around them, and they've got to keep a constant motion going the other direction. It's pretty high stress life. So uh, all of these things, um, you know, can be sort of environmental indicators and, and, and stressors. Um, dare I call them features uh, that that in, that uh, you know really can affect your 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 niche. To go back to one of our older words. So salinity is more than just salt. Again, if you've ever had, so I'm, I'm giving you guys basically a great big research project. I keep talking about if you've been, been lucky enough to get to the ocean or not. Hop in your car this summer. It's not that far away. You could even go there and back in the same day, not have to worry about a hotel bill. Go get your toes in the water. And if you're lucky enough, get a little bit of it splashed into your mouth and then go rinse. But and you'll see that it's not the same as salt water. You've ever had to gargle for the doctor because you had a sore throat. Table salt and water doesn't taste anything like the ocean. And no, it's not the pollution and all that stuff. There's just so many other things in there. All right. Sodium chloride is good old-fashioned salt. Uh, magnesium sulfate, potassium nitrate, sodium bicarbonate. I don't expect you to know what those are. Yeah. But, but um, they are all salts in the chemical world. Okay. Um, so... There's a lot of stuff dissolved in there. And where does that come from? It comes from all the rocks. We don't really get into that too much. I try to keep this class very separate from my geology class when, when I can. But all that stuff that's in the ocean, you know, came from somewhere, from running over the rocks, dissolving all the rocks over the years, not to mention all the fish poop and fish pee and, and, and all that other stuff. Yum. Okay. Um, <laughs> the ocean has been collecting these things for, for all, all those years. And um, it is it is definitely some unique stuff. Yeah. So this is crooked, or not crooked, sideways, uh, because I wanted to keep it large. And I'm just going to assume that you guys can read sideways. Just tilt your head like this. Yeah, whatever you got to do. Yep. Like this. And what this is showing you is your very typical water bottle uh, that... You guys that do have water, mostly using the uh, refillable water, which is good for you. Uh, but uh, I know it's not good for you, but it's not good for the earth either. But they're the right size. At least bottles. Oh yeah, water bottles is not necessarily good for the ocean. Yeah. yeah. I try not to use them. I only use them when it's full when I'm at school. There you go. So. Um, Yet we still sell millions of them, right? And by the 24s and 48s and whatever's at all the stores. But yeah, thanks. But they're out there. Sure. So picture that, my point being, lest we digress again. Uh, my point being, picture that standard water bottle that you guys have had a hundred times in your hand. That 25 and, is not looking great for me. Yeah, that's all the fresh water we got. Ugh. All right. So basically turn that bottle upright and think about that last. All right, let's, let's let me talk now for a little bit. Um, Think about that last sip that's in the bottom of your bottle. That's where we'll start. All right. That last sip is basically of all the water we got on the land. Remember, the, the, the ocean is, is, I'm sorry, the, yeah, you could say that. Um, the, the, the earth is covered nearly three quarters um, with water, right? And the majority of that is ocean. Of all the water that we have, that last sip in your water bottle is what we consider fresh water. We did the water cycle in here, right? Hydrologic cycle already? Yes, we did. Okay. So you got water on the land, you got water in the ground, and you got water in the air. All of that that is fresh, usable water is that last sip in your water bottle. And we build up from there. Next is what we call brackish, and that brings you up to about halfway. Brackish is what we were just talking about a couple minutes ago. It's where you've got... Um, a mixing of fresh and salt water. Think coastal environments. Yeah. All right. Um, I grew up thinking that brackish actually meant. Um, I think I confused that with brine. Brine is ultra ultra salty, and I thought brackish meant that. Brackish is sort of that that mix. And again, if you've been lucky enough to get to to the beach, you you know when you're starting to get close because the air smells different. You could smell that salt, you could smell all that decaying organic material too. Um, 
it has a very, and, and that's the bracket, all right? Um, you know you're there. And you see the word estuaries we used a couple minutes ago is in there, uh, mangroves, um, and who's landed? Just gotta go through customs. Um, so uh, estuaries, mangroves, swamps, uh, a bunch of stuff that we're gonna talk about is actual environments. So next we have salt water, all right, which basically takes you almost to the top of your water bottle there. So what we're showing you here is that there's almost as much brackish water as there is just straight out seawater, okay? Um, and what we're increasing are parts per thousand. That's what PPT means, parts per thousand. Um, so if there were a thousand waters in that bottle, little water molecules, okay, um, how much of it is, is taken up by water and how much is taken up by dissolved solids, so to speak. And then the very tip top of the bottle where, you know, sometimes it's filled all the way up to the lid, sometimes it's just close to the lid, that's your brine water, that's your ultra salty stuff. Um, along the other side of this diagram, we have examples, for lack of a better word. Uh, drinking water is way down um, after your last sip, that little bit of water that's left in there, even after you've taken your last sip and you knock it over and it still spills a little bit, okay? We're looking at 0 0.1 parts per thousand. So less than one-tenth of one thousandth is acceptable for dissolved solids. Uh, we move up to uh, the Baltic Sea as we're going, talking about brackish water. That's at eight parts per thousand. The Black Sea, 18 parts per thousand. Um, average seawater is, we're going to round up to 35 parts per thousand. Mediterranean, even saltier. Red Sea, even saltier. And uh, I'm going to assume Salt Lake City in Nevada, which I've also had a mouthful rather involuntarily, um, is um, is up there as well. Go ahead. Salt Lake City is It is. It is. But uh, it's called, there was an old lake back in the glacier days. There was Lake Bonneville. And um, it has dried up over the years and concentrated the salts and so on and so forth. There's a lot of natural salts in the area. And it's concentrated it up right now. And it is it is super salty. Uh, so much so that, that really only a uh, brine shrimp can live there. So, yeah. So does it evaporate and not lose it? No, it does. It, it increases it. That's how we got that far. Oh. It's, it's only getting saltier. Put it that way. Because salt, salt doesn't evaporate. Only water evaporates. Yeah, I know, but okay. I mean, when it remains, doesn't that separate it from the salt so when you're under the fresh water? Oh, well, sort of. So it rain. It, okay, great question. Uh, the, the problem is, is that it doesn't go very far because Utah is a fairly arid area, not a whole lot of moisture in the first place. So when it evaporates out of the lake, goes up into the clouds, and it might move over to the mountains, fall as snow, but then that spring it rolls back down, and it just goes right back into the lake. So... Um, yeah, great, great question. Well, that was done. In, in general, again, the water's not going to move too far. Water cycle, I don't know, I've never said this out loud, but it sounds right. Uh, it, it tends to stay fairly local. I mean, there's obviously some big, we talked about those huge jet streams and currents and stuff the other day. But, but generally speaking, when you're talking about the water cycle, I don't know miles, I'm just making up numbers, but local in quotes, you know, certainly within your state, I would say it stays. Um, I don't know, then you start talking about lake effect snow, that picks up, that picks up moisture from, well, from the lake, and that drops it, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 miles later. Yeah, I, I think I'm comfortable saying water cycle is a fairly local event. But odd that I've never answered that in 20 years of talking about it. But yeah, no, that's exactly what happens. It might not have been what he asked me, but it's, it's, it's worth bringing up 
Um, it, it, it sounds stupid to say it this way, but yeah, salt doesn't evaporate. Only the water evaporates, any of these solids. So when the water does evaporate, um, it increases the concentration of whatever's been dissolved in it. The, the concentration gets left behind, all right? And or it gets deposited, the salt flats around Utah. If you follow um, car racing or anything like that, that's a great place they like to go out there because it's, it's practically pavement. So this, the salt mixes with the sand as it dries, and it makes this hard, hard, hard pan, I think they call it. Uh, we broke the land speed record out there because um, it's just a vast expanse of, of nothingness. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that all gets left, uh, left behind. So anywho, more to the, the fact here. We're just trying to give you a, an easy way to understand, uh, not just the fact that we're increasing uh, parts per thousand, but, uh, I'm sorry, that we're increasing salinity, but um, with regard to how much water we have on the planet, sort of a breakdown of, of what's where. All right, totally shifting gears. This PowerPoint is at least all one topic, but it's kind of eclectic, okay? Uh, we're going to hop around from, from this to that to the other thing, and there's going to be some overlap. And I'm going to try to point out to you guys where it's traditionally confusing for you. What's a niche? Someone remind us what a niche is. Okay. So your role, for, for example, in an environment, or so a job or career, your role in the environment, the place you exist in the environment. So, what these three aquatic niches are is kind of the opposite angle of looking at that. It is three ways you can exist in an aquatic environment. You could be a plankton, you could be a nectin, or you could be a benthic. All right. Mm -hmm. So, we all know Plankton, and we'll yes. giggle about him in a little bit, but... <laughs> yes, sir. Um, in a nutshell, Plankton are floaters, Nectin are swimmers, and the Benthos are crawlers or tunnelers or diggers kind of thing. So you can either live in the water, crawl them, and go wherever the ocean brings you, with some say in what you do vertically. Or you could be a free swimmer, which are the nectins. Or you live down, either attached to a rock or crawling around the rocks. You follow? Yeah. That's all the next handful of slides are going to be explaining to you. They're going to throw a lot of vocabulary at you. But just keep in mind that there's three lifestyles, three niches, three roles you can play. All right, so plankton or floaters, they can um, migrate vertically in the water. Um, when do you think they come up to feed themselves, in the day or in the night? Night. How come? All right, that's that's an interesting idea. Um, might be easier. Well, let's jump to let's before we do that, let's look at the last two bullets. What's the difference in those two plankton? What's what? What's a phytoplankton versus a zooplankton? Oh, well, zooplankton works as well. Anybody? Folks in the back? What kind of plankton is that? What you say? Zooplankton versus phytoplankton. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? I just like the regular plankton. <laughs> well, which one is he is a great question, too. All right. So what do you go see at the zoo? Down the street. Animals. Animals. Phyto is plants. So phytoplankton are floating plants. They're not going to swim vertically at all. Zooplankton are the actual critters. 
And again, they can, with their little flagellum or cilia, or depending on what kind of critter they are, they can have, like I said, a little bit of say. And they do tend to migrate in the water column to come up and eat the phytoplankton, which are just everywhere at once. So what he said was interesting about, um, you know, maybe the nighttime, some of the other critters, it's colder, they might not be as active. That is a pretty good time to feed, but that's not why they come up then. They come up then because the bigger things that like to eat are asleep. Now, is the zooplankton, him aside, he's quite the thinker, all right, don't get me wrong, but do you think zooplankton are thinking that? No, they don't know anything about that. In fact, they probably can't even flee or get concerned if they see a fish. I doubt they have the wherewithal for that. From the background of this class, what we can assume is that all of the plankton that, for whatever reason, decided to vertically migrate during the day are now dead and did not reproduce. However, all the plankton that, for whatever reason, arbitrarily decided to migrate at night, they live to reproduce. You had a question, ma'am. Oh, I was just going to say what I think. Well, which one I think. Oh, well, good. Were you right? Were you going to be right? I was going to say zooplankton. Okay. Oh, for critters? Or for what? For I forget what my question was at this point. For oh, what plankton is? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, they made them green. So that lends us to thinking about chlorophyll and plants. But he does talk and walk and so. Because he's not a plant. Probably not. I mean, if you take Bikini Bottom at face value, <laughs> I assume it's a Bikini Atoll, right? It is. Which is yeah, where we, they say, yeah. Did bottom. they actually say? I've, I've not Googled it ever, but I just assumed. Which is where we tested all the nuclear bombs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you guys that's know how that. they came to be. And, okay, see, I, I didn't know I had a fan theory. Cool. I just thought I was playing. I, I know that Hildebrand, the guy that drew the comic, was a marine biologist. He passed away, unfortunately, but um, I know he had he was trained as a marine biologist. When the nuclear bombs were dropped, they became very volatile. So yeah, I assume that's how we mutated a household sponge and a starfish. And Correct. by the way, the starfish is supposed to be smarter than the sponge. Yeah. Not vice versa. <laughs> starfish are way start. You're more related to a starfish than you are to a sponge. Sponges are barely alive. But, um, Barely, they're non, they're inanimate objects. No, they're animals. No, they're they are, they are a tad, they're inanimate because they are what we call sessile. You'll see this when we get to um, uh, benthic people. They, they they attach themselves to rocks, but they are animals. Again, whether or not they have brains and think is another question. Sentience, sentience is hard to measure, but. All right, again, lest we digress. So plankton are floaters. We're going to acknowledge the fact that some of them can swim, but a wave comes by, they're gone. Okay, so they're just, it's its nearly coincidental that they can swim. Um, and then plankton come in two varieties, phytoplankton, which are plants, usually photosynthetic, green guys with chlorophyll, which is what I was arguing about, hit plankton, they went and made him green. Um, but... Zooplankton then are a whole bunch of other critters, and you'd think I'd have some pictures, but I don't. I guess I gotta update this. So phytoplankton, photosynthetic algae and cyanobacteria. Uh, the blue-green algae is cyano. Um, that's the stuff that was supposedly the first life on the planet. And um, these guys also have to be up the top of the water column because they need sunlight in order to make energy. So these are basically the to, to go back and try to touch this into what we talked about with the wolf, the bunny, the clover, you know, our usual food web on, on our earth, on the surface of the earth. The phytoplankton are the base of the food chain in the um, primary producers in an aquatic environment. So zooplankton, we're looking at protozoa, which are just these weird little teeny tiny guys. Uh, crustaceans, typically... Um, you're going to see a lot, of, yeah, larval stages. There we go. Larval stages of many organisms uh, are are these little uh, plankton as well. But there are some teeny tiny crustaceans out there. I actually started my uh, master's degree studying um, 
Oh, the name just jumped out of. Not copepods. Some horribly boring little uh, crabs that lived in a clam shell. But they're so small that I had to stare at a microscope with a the finest little paintbrush you could use if you were like one of those people who paints like little miniature Dungeons and Dragons figurines or something like that. Tiniest little paintbrush poking bits of rock that weren't my critters out of the picture and then trying to put my little crit... Oh, I hated it. I hated, you know how you get that headache sometimes with microscopes? And, and micropaleontology was not for me. Um, That's micro. My, yeah, yeah, exactly. Micro. Teeny tiny. That should have been a hint, but um, that's what job they had waiting for me, and uh, I couldn't. I wasn't getting into it, and the guy came and took his uh, his fossils and said no more. So luckily, there was somebody there with horse toes, which were much bigger, and I had to drive to Nebraska to get them too, which was almost fun. How long was that? The drive? Yeah. Much longer than it should have been because it was March, which is when colleges have their spring break. So they had actually closed Route 80 down. And we didn't know I was driving a up the Plymouth Neon or a Chrysler Neon, a silly little car at the time. And we were driving in two tracks. Um, and police finally happened to come by. And they're like, we closed the road three hours ago. You guys didn't know? And I'm like, no, we didn't know. So we were stuck an extra day and a half in uh, some godforsaken town somewhere. But it was an experience. And that's what college is supposed to be about, right? Experience. Try that. Yeah. Um, but you think the IJ should be somewhat white or inclusive? Ah, uh, I'm sure it varies. Um, why do you ask? What because color do they are? I, I, I'm thinking of the person that like wears it. Oh, okay, yeah. Excuse me again. Well, the phyto should be green, just because they've got chlorophyll in them. Mm -hmm. um, zooplankton, I mean, you're not going to want to invest a whole lot of um, energy into building a shell, because that's just going to make you heavier, which is just going to make it harder for you to get up and down in the water column. So they're not going to be real dark colored, I suppose. They might be see-through. I don't know. Never thought of that before. But I, I'd, I'd hazard to say that they come in a lot of subtle shades. But, but yeah. And I don't know if, if whales eat Phyto or Zoe. Probably they eat whatever they can get. But. All right. So, as we said before, uh, plankton are basically the base of the, uh, the food chain. All right. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton, and the zooplankton are eaten by. Um, newly hatched fish, and yes, the whole conundrum about how the world's largest mammal eats the world's smallest animal uh, and, and gets sustenance from that. But um, they eat a whole lot of plankton when they do. And they've got these cool little teeth like toothbrushes. Um, and their mouth is full of bristles and it just filters out. Um, and they get a big mouthful of water so they'll swim through a, a herd. I guess we could call plankton a herd and uh, swarm, and uh, they filter out all those nummy little plants and get the nutrients out of it, and critters, plankton, I should just say. But again, most importantly, the base of the food chain, and with that one weird exception, uh, it, it works as normal. The slightly bigger things eat the slightly smaller things, and so on and so forth. All right, enough plankton. Nectin. Necton. Feel free to pronounce it however you want. Nectin, yeah. um, these are the swimmers. Fish, turtles, whales. I just tried to cover a little bit of everything there. Um, we have three different classes of vertebrates there, since this is biology. Might be worth pointing that out. We've got the fish, which are their own critters. Turtles are what's this? Reptiles, yep. And whales, as we just said, are... Mammals. Mammals. So we got fishes, reptiles, and mammals uh, that we could use here. Uh, the nectin, again, is is Latin, Latin, English, Greek, one of those two. Uh, somewhere in there is that nect is uh, for swimming. 
the benthic folks, uh, the benthos, these are the bottom dwellers. All right. Uh, as I said, there's a couple ways you could live down there. You could be attached, what we typically call sessile. I guess I didn't feel the need to give you that as a vocabulary word. Um, your sponges, your oysters, your barnacles. Okay, these are critters that have found it best to attach themselves to a rock or some other thing. Uh, that is typically because they are filter feeders. They want the water to be able to flow through them uh, so they can catch uh, food rather easily. You got your burrowers. These are things that are apparently quite yummy because other things like to eat them. And it was at some point beneficial uh, that those that learned to burrow uh, did not get it. Um, you got your worms, your clams. Clams do burrow. That's actually another fun thing to do at the water. Uh, and you can even do this if you grab a handful of sand. The water comes over, washes the top layer of sand off, and then all the little clammies, real quick, will like zip down even further. And then the water comes back over, puts more sand. They're like, oh my god, now I can't breathe. Okay, and I got to go up a little bit. And the water washes away the sand, and then I got to go back down again. It's it's it's, it's incredibly high energy life. Not to mention sea cucumbers, right? Um, that's an odd critter. Have you ever seen a sea cucumber? Google it one day when you're bored. I always picture it kind of look like that, uh, what do they call them, those water willies? Or those weird things you get when you're a kid, those sort of like cylindrical tube of water that slips as you, you grab it and you inevitably end up breaking it like three days later in the car or on your mom's good couch or something. Um, I, I always picture they look like that. They do not look like that at all. Do not look like that at all. So burrowers... Um, these guys can be, clams are, are filter feeders, I know that. Worms uh, and sea cucumbers, I think, actively feed. Um, and then the walkers. Starfish, crawfish, crayfish, whatever. Um, starfish are amazing critters. Uh, Patrick, again, aside jokingly. Um, they uh, they don't have uh, muscles per se. They have what's called a hydrovascular system, where they uh, have all these tubes that go through them, and they actually um, fill up with water to straighten out, shoot water out to, to shrink down, and through that amazing uh, orchestration, they could somehow walk and be strong enough to pry open um, clamshells and, and all that stuff. Uh, they have a vicious little beak right in the center of their mouth, uh, and they're full of tube feet. They're, they're just really cool critters. Really cool critters. All right, so um, hopefully if you guys have a, a good mind's eye kind of thing, you're, you're picturing these environments we're talking about, all right? Whether you've been down snorkeling or not, I, I highly don't imagine, but you've seen this stuff on TV. Okay, watching the Nature Channel, National Geographic, and, and, and this, that, and the other thing. You've seen cameras swoop across the ocean floor. You can picture schools of fish swimming around. You might not be able to picture the benthos, or not the benthos, the plankton going up and down and all of that. But, again, you could probably get the idea. And while these aren't common environments that, you know, like I said, we're likely to stumble upon primarily because of where we live, um, You've got some idea of them. And just like you've probably never seen a tundra, but you, you had an idea in your head of what a tundra is and what it looked like. So while these might actually be a little more foreign, I, ar I argue that, uh, you know, thanks to the media for once, um, you have a decent idea of what we're, we're talking about. And I apologize that I don't have more pictures. One of the things that I've done in, in more recent years is go back through a lot of my PowerPoints and add... Um, more pictures. I think I was of the, the concern in the past that too many slides is, you know, well, too many slides. But pictures can be quite helpful. So we just have to pull from our memory banks for these things to get a nice idea of what's going on here. Well, I want to change slides. There we go. All right, we're going to go inland now. And instead of talking about um, the ocean, which all of those critters, I kind of just painted a picture for oceans, all right? 
uh, we have many of those same niches, but in fresh water. Many of the same niches, but in fresh water. For the easiest picturing of that, again, I would go with a lake, okay? Because streams introduce their own difficulties, constantly flowing water, the bashing into rocks, as we mentioned. Living in a marsh or a swamp, a wetland, okay, you've got a high, high amount of vegetation there, where again, it, it could be great places to hide. And in fact, um, majority of our, we're going coastal again, but the majority of, if you're a seafood fan, um, just about anything and everything that you that you enjoy eating grows up um, in those those wetlands next to the coast. It's a great place to hide, all right, and a great place to come lay eggs that is safe. Again, were their parents thinking that? No, they weren't. But it's the ones that happened to lay eggs there that lived to reproduce. The ones that just laid their eggs out in the ocean to float around, yeah, that didn't work out so well. So just trying to pick up that, that thread of evolution that we, we talked about earlier. All right. Um, I always question these couple slides here. I, uh, for the time being, I'm going to skip these two slides. If you guys printed out the uh, handouts, don't put an X through them because we might come back to them eventually. What's an X through? An X through them. Oh, that's right. But right now, I'm not going to burden you guys with the stream anatomy. Okay. So we're skipping two slides. All right. And here's where it gets confusing. So we just talked about three ways of living in an aquatic environment, the plankton, the nectin, and the benthon, all right? Um, and we call those niches. Now we're going into a lake environment, and we're going to talk about three niches, but that are viewed from the other perspective. They're viewed from... I don't even know if it's quite the other person. They're just different. It's same but different. Um, littoral, limnetic, and profundal. We'll explain what each of these means. Don't worry. Um, but you're going to see that there's, it's kind of different names for the same thing. And, and why these people felt the need to do this, I don't know. Uh, I suppose, uh, and we'll just use America as an example. We could picture that easiest. I suppose um, biologists growing up in Kansas and doing their work in Kansas had little to no contact with biologists growing up and doing their work in North Carolina. Okay? Oh, I understand that. So they developed their own vocabulary, more or less for talking about the same thing. Even though we're in the same country. Same country, same, and, and these, are, these are even, I don't want to say universal, of course, but you know, on a global, these, you know, these are terms we use uh, across the world. But the fact why fresh water and salt water needs different vocabulary is beyond me. So, so what is the littoral zone? Well, the shoreline. Why the hell don't we just call it the shore? The shoreline. So, littoral zone is shallow water, shoreline. Okay, um, it's 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 nice uh, for the for the organisms that live there for a couple reasons. Um, you've got plenty of light that goes through to the bottom. Remember, you want to build a food chain, you need the sun, no matter where you are, unless you're one of those weird chemosynthesizing, chemical fixing, deep sea vent kind of communities. That's rare. So you need the sun. So a littoral environment is a great place for that. That's you, imagine you walking out and uh, basically keeping your head above water. It goes a little further than that, but all of that is littoral zone, okay? Last time you were swimming out at a lake or something like that. Um, also, lakes tend to not have a wave shoreline. Your oceans, the shorelines are great, but again, for little critters, it's a tough life. Those waves are very powerful. 
You don't have to be that big to get waves. Oneida Lake has waves lapping the shore, but they're gentle. Lake Ontario has waves. They could get a little bigger, but they're still not comparable to trying to live on the coast. So you've got sunlight going through the water. You've got a relatively low energy environment. All right. And which means you could focus more on living rather than trying to stay alive. Now, you still have your critters going through that want to eat you. You've got plenty of fish. And again, if you've stood quietly enough uh, ankle deep in some water and looked around, you will see a bunch of little fish swimming around. And you know if you go out deeper, there's going to be slightly bigger fish and slightly bigger fish. You know how it works. So emergent and submergent plants, what do you think the uh, difference there is? What are those two words, what are they trying to imply? Yeah. Uh, some plants are out of, like, you can see them out of water, and some are under the water. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so you got, you got plants living underwater, you got plants that start underwater and grow out of it. So an emergent plant, think of cattail. Not exactly the right environment, but cattails are always in, like, wet, marshy, swampy kinds of things, right? They're down there in that muck, but they grow up and out. Um, seaweed, for lack of a better word. Again, we're in fresh water here, so eh, it's not seaweed technically. But um, is is another thing for for an <coughs> submergent. Like, like, <coughs> Sorry. Wait, 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 ocean is saltwater. Yeah. Wait, okay. So seaweed is ocean. Yeah, technically speaking. But we get yeah. similar stuff that looks like it in fresh water. Um, I am by no means, botany is one of my least sciences, um, even though I took higher aquatic plants while I was at uh, a summer program on Lake Erie. Um, I could probably rattle off three or four plant names if I had to. But um, nonetheless, you guys probably wouldn't know them. And I'm not being elitist. I'm just honestly, do you know any aquatic plant names? No. Yeah. So, and do you care? No. But if you do fish tanks and you go to the fish store, boy, do they know their names. All right? And, and you could toss a couple of those around uh, when you get there. Um, Eka, and then there is one right on the tip of my tongue because it's really fun to have in your aquarium. Eka something. Echinaria. Eka, da, 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 da. I'm going to have to go to Pet Smarts after class now. Um, but at any rate, yep, right class. Welcome, guys. Um, critters, frogs, tadpoles, turtles, worms, crayfish, small fish. Again, hopefully you've stood in, in a, ankle deep in a pond at 20 some odd years of your life. If you haven't, you have more homework. Go stand in a pond. Wait for it to get a little warmer, though. But go do that and look around. Limnetic. You ain't touching the bottom anymore. You're swimming, you're treading water, and depending on the lake, you know, it, it can be, well, lakes can be as deep as they want to be. Around here, you guys know there's some pretty deep lakes, green lakes, finger lakes. Those suckers are deep. Lake Ontario, not incredibly deep, Isn't depending it? on where you are, but, sorry? Lake Ontario. What about Lake Ontario? I didn't hear that part. Canada? No, well, part of it is. Uh, Lake Ontario is, is an hour and a half northwest of here. It's, it's above Syracuse. Well, there is a city in Canada. That is true. Okay. It's your closest Great Lake, and you should visit it. All of you. All right. Uh, the open water, at any rate. Where you're out boating is a great way to think about it. Maybe you're in Lake Ontario. Okay, a lot of families have boats around here. I don't know any of the lakes up there. First Lake up to 100th Lake or whatever they do in the Adirondacks. Um, when you're out in the open water, deep water, okay, that is the limnetic zone. In fact, the study of lakes is called limnology, just for the hell of it there. Uh, extends as far down as sunlight penetrates. So wait a minute, you don't mean we're talking from the top of the water all the way down to the bottom? No, they're that particular. Okay, the limnetic zone is open water that's horizontal, like as you can see from the land or from your boat but it has a vertical component to it. They only want to call it as far down as sunlight goes. It's the life zone. So you get phyto and zooplankton, obviously, and then fish. 
We say larger fish. Again, it's safer to grow up as a little fish closer to the shoreline because guess what? The bigger fish can't come eat you. But at some point, you got to move out. You get too big to be in the shallow water. You get stepped on by the swimmers, etc., etc. Or more so, you just want more food. It's time to swim out. So we say larger fish, but of course, there is a, a variety of there. So you might be wondering, what the heck is below the limnetic zone, since we care vertically and not just horizontally? Profundal. Profundal as in before or the early fundal. Uh, this is below the limnetic zone. Uh, small lakes and ponds lack a profundal zone. In other words, the sun makes it all the way to the bottom. If you think about it, that makes sense. So again, your deeper lakes are going to have an area where the sunlight doesn't reach. Um, this is where in all of your Hollywood movies, some deep, dark creature comes up from down there and, and, and attacks the person in the canoe, right? Um, oh, yeah. No plants or algae. This is a, not exactly a dead zone, as in everything there is dead, but it's where all of the nectin and the um, um, pl uh, plankton fall to when they die. You're not going to get a whole lot of benthos here either, again, because, I mean, unless they're scavengers, which there are some. Um, there, there, there's no sunlight, there's no life, there's no critters, yeah. Um, the lag features, I was looking at on this, and a lot of the flowers that I plant, it's like from the lake and the beach to hybrid. Yeah, tan, I, 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 was, I was hoping you were going that route there. Uh, it's called tannins. It's basically like making tea. It doesn't. There's some areas where they're soaking. The leaves are just in there, falling down from the trees, all around the shoreline. Um... And the groundwater, and not the groundwater exactly, the surface water as well when it rains, it comes through the, I imagine you're surrounded by trees as well. Um, you know, all the water coming through there. It doesn't take long to soak. I mean, again, think about making a cup of tea. You know, you're in there two, three minutes tops. Um, but yeah, it's tannins. Tannins, tannins, tannins. And that's the coloring, the, the pigment in the leaves. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it, it depends on the lake, depends on the temperature. Those guys are going to want to live. First of all, you don't see a whole lot of crabs in um, freshwater. We do have freshwater clams. We do have freshwater crabs. Um, crayfish, for example, which are little mini lobsters if you've not seen a crayfish. Um, but they're going to be up closer to shore where there's little things to eat. Because, again, what are they going to eat down there? Short of the dead stuff that falls down. And, again, there are some organisms that enjoy that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they're gonna eat other crabs too. But um, but for the most part, those guys are up up a little closer. And you don't have a base because there's no sunlight. There's no base of the food chain there. So food and dead. Or here we go. Food and dead organisms float down, and bacteria decompose it. Uh, the bacteria use up oxygen, so it is a dead zone. Um, which means no oxygen. You guys just did a lab where you tested for dissolved oxygen. Uh, but it is nutrient-rich. <coughs> and a word you may have heard, it should have a slide here somewhere, somewhere. upwelling. All right. Uh, lakes turn over. And what happens is, is we bring up this, this old nasty water from the bottom, and it, those nutrients, they rely on those nutrients to come up. And something's got to feed the phytoplankton beyond sunlight, okay? They need a little bit of nutrients, too. Uh, and, and somehow, I, I guess you've just got enough photosynthesis going on up there where you don't notice all the uh, unoxygenated water coming up. But the, uh, the, uh, the nutrients more than make up for the lack of, lack of oxygen. So that might have been a little hard to picture. Uh, so here's a nice image for once, okay? And again, um, you know, just picture and thinking your lake up at it's your cabin there, your camp, um, or or if you've been to one of the to the uh, Finger Lakes or something like that. All right. So the area where you're out poking around and and uh, kayaking, maybe this that or the other thing, you're probably in the littoral zone. All right. You go way out into the center of the lake, and you don't fall out of your kayak. You're in the limnetic zone. Um, 
when the giant kraken comes up out of the depths and pulls you out of your kayak and sucks you down, then you're going to go down by that there profundal zone. Okay. With a kraken. Yes. A dust ball of kayak. Yeah. That's he's so very <laughs> he's very hungry. Very hungry. Use your kraken to take all six. And they're ruthless. I know it'd be a waste, but it is a lake, so he's got to do what he's got to do. The kraken's got a crack, right? Uh, yeah. I don't just them. All right. Anyhow, how about a ferry boat then? Will that work? All right. So we'll go to Lake Champlain and we'll be on a ferry boat. All right. Thank you. Totally relevant right now, right? The Kraken are real. Technically, you can think of Oxford or Oxford. Is there a Oxford? I don't know if we have any freshwater, at least not on this continent, we don't have freshwater octopuses. Octopi. Um, I mean, you know the Megalodon, right? I do know Megalodon. Yeah, I know. Uh, I've thank, got, God, thank God we don't have those in I've got there. one of his teeth down in my lap. Yeah, thank but God we don't have those <laughs> The largest freshwater fish we've ever had a fossil of came off of Route 90, um, right by about an hour into Ohio. So those guys were swimming around here at one point. It's not that far-fetched to think. No, it is totally far-fetched. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the things change. Environments change. But, honest to God, his, his skull, it's, it's Dunkleosteus. I saw it as a freshman in college, and it completely blew my mind. His head was as big as a Volkswagen bug. Crazy thing. Volkswagen. Question, sir. Just stretch it. Uh, alligators or crocodiles keep ending up at one feet of the water? Adron. <laughs> Wait, what's the difference between alligators and crocodiles? Release. I don't know that one. Uh, I'm guessing they get released. How they manage to make it through a winter, I don't know. Uh, because really, okay, I don't, I don't watch the news, but I do hear. You know, you hear about like, the sewers in New York. Sewers, I can understand because they're actually warm. But uh, Adirondack lakes, ooh, ooh, that's cold. That's cold. And reptiles do not like cold. But um, you know, the, the the other the snakes and stuff do overwinter. So I know that the zoo here sends theirs to a facility somewhere, because I asked them the same question. Um, they send them to a facility somewhere. I forget where. So ours, they do not overwinter at the zoo here. And I don't know the difference between alligators and crocodiles. I apologize. I do know that they could climb trees, though. So never try to escape an alligator by running up a tree uh, or a crocodile. Oh, yeah, like 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 crazy. They use strong hands, though, for a fast one. But they're, they're, they can go right up a tree. It's on YouTube. You watch it. Alligators can go up trees. But not crocodiles? Okay. Or are you questioning me? Is that a question or a statement? A question. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's... That's it. insane. Oh, so you fucking talk about trees. <laughs> are you kidding me? I think it's the same way cats land. <laughs> cats usually <laughs> land on their feet. They have that <laughs> If you dropped a crocodile out of the tree, would it land on its feet? I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to move on. I'm just going to move on. Yeah, so yeah, don't... Yeah. Run, run for your car, not up a tree. I mean, I can't really climb a Anywho. Anywho. Turnover. We just talked about this. So... So, surface water cools... This is, this is related to temperature. Cool, cool things contract, get more dense, hot things expand. Remember air, we talked about this. Same is true with water, all right? So in the fall, the surface waters cool off. They're not getting heated by the sun that often. Um, they then sink. Now, you wouldn't think, I don't think, and I even know a little bit about this, that they could get cold enough that they would displace the water at the bottom, but apparently they do. So what happens is that cold water sinks down, it pushes the other water up out, and that brings those nutrients up. Um, and then again, it happens in the uh, spring as well, and we get these algal blooms, okay? And that's even with all the agriculture aside. When you're going back to talking about Oneida Lake and Sylvan Beach and all that, the majority of that is from runoff from the agriculture. You're surrounded by farmland up there. And not just the fertilizers, but all the poop, the pigs and the cows exactly. and the chickens and all of that. Um, and the algae itself isn't horrible, but a lot of times um, certain kind of the red ones, I forget what they are, uh, release a toxin and it, it gives a decent amount of people rashes 
So that's why they'd rather close the beach for a week than uh, get it on the news that, you know, dozens of people were got rashes today at Sylvan Beach and blah, 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 and then nobody's there for the rest of the month. So that's why they, they do that. Um, but that's not from turnover, typically. A diagram about turnover. All right. Way more interesting, the wetlands. Um, wetlands have always been the disposable environment for us. Um, I, I don't know why. Probably because they tend to have mosquitoes and we can't go there and have nice picnics because it's wet and damp and nasty. And I don't know. We've just always, if it, one of, they want to destroy an environment, one of the first things they destroy is a wetland. Um, and that stinks because wetlands are there for a reason. Everything is there for a reason. If, if that hasn't become a common theme yet in this class, uh, it, it should have. And I apologize. Mother Nature puts stuff where it needs it, be it a critter or be it plants and, and whatever. So the wetlands are there because there's a surplus of water, okay? It's not enough to turn itself into a lake, but it's too much to be a stream and a field. So there's a large amount of water there. Because of that, only certain plants can live there. Because only certain plants are there, you get a certain kind of organisms, critters, that are there. But we want to throw up a new Walmart or put up a farm or whatever. What do we do? We drain a wetland. And now, because we have wonderful laws, um, we say, if you destroy a wetland, you need to recreate a wetland. So then we go to make up for it and put a wetland where there wasn't a wetland. And then we get confused as to why it turns into a dryland. Um, it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's somebody making somebody else feel good by saying, well, we're going to change this environment, but we'll reconstruct it somewhere else. If it was meant to be there, it would have been there already. Sangertown Mall actually did a fairly decent job of this. It's my understanding that Yana de Hassas and the Sangertown Mall area was all swamp. They drained. I think the, the golf course came first. They drained the golf course to build the to build to build the golf course. They drained it over by the mall. <clears throat> and then when they did the mall, they basically dug trenches around. You notice when you're going into targets, off to your right and off to the left. Off to the left towards Moses is a little harder to see. But off to the right, there's that giant pool, for lack of a better word, a big square area. Mm -hmm. um, they semi-successfully just made it a bigger, deeper sort of wetland. Um, but the area off to the left goes all the way down to, how do you say it, Bremers, Bremers, whatever the liquor store is down that way. Curves all the way back around there and then along the uh, the Judd Road thing towards uh, downtown New Hartford there. That's all wetland there area. Um, they managed to do it fairly well because they didn't try to build it somewhere else. They just pushed it to the outskirts. But most of the time, we just don't have any any regard for it. Um, so there's a difference between a marsh and a swamp. All right, um, a marsh is tends to be more grassy. A swamp, on the other hand, is has more trees. So if you've ever wondered what's the difference between a swamp and a marsh, all right. Uh, swamps are when there's still a lot of woody vegetation. Uh, marshes are more grassy. So we got the Utica Marsh over here, which again is man-made, by the way. Um, I didn't know that one either. I thought it was natural. I didn't grow up here, so I'm learning all this stuff as a 30-year-old when I came. Um, but the uh, they it was part of the when they, they developed the canal system. They had to drain a whole lot of stuff. Uh, in Starch Factory Creek, you guys are going there in lab this week. If you go down far enough, it just sort of disappears into a tube, a hill, side of a hill, a bridge. It goes under the city and then emerges down um, somewhere by the throughway. So we completely routed that river underwater. Kind of, kind of cool. Uh, underwater, underground. Um, so freshwater wetlands, all right. 
Uh, so where fresh water covers at least uh, the land for at least part of the year, and it has a special type of vegetation. All right, that's what marks a, a wetland. And wetlands are protected, as I started to say, by the government, but there's some rather silly rules of protection uh, involved. The reason that we shouldn't just take them for granted or take them as, as throwaway stuff is because the, the biodiversity, to bring back a word we talked about a, a, a while ago, is huge in the wetlands. Huge. Um, plus, they're an important part of the water cycle. Uh, first of all, they are a, a great source for flood control. They're meant to hold water. All right. Uh, they recharge groundwater, too. Water level rises and comes comes and goes in a uh, in a marsh, all right. But they're connected to the thing. They also clean the water. Uh, the mud and the muck in these these marshes is nasty, but that's great because that means the water that's getting through down into the aquifers, the the, the groundwater, is a lot cleaner. So these are really important things. It's almost like as bad as burning down the rainforests. But nobody seems to care about them because they're infested with mosquitoes. Rainforests? Well, those too, but marshes. What are marshes? I've been talking about them for 10 minutes now. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. All right. Moving on. Estuaries. Estuaries are special areas where fresh and salt water mix. Um, we started our conversation today informally about uh, estuaries. Usually what you're seeing is a river flowing to the ocean. And um, I can't give you a percentage, but a lot of the times that happens to be in a semi-enclosed area. I, I don't know if there's a reason for that or not. And as such, it ends up making a bay, right? Um, you know, whether or not you know what a bay is, just kind of think about it. It's a sort of semi-enclosed area. Um, it's as close as we're going to get to having a, a closed system on an ocean. The land sort of makes a bowl shape, and um, it, it limits mixing. So you've got fresh water emptying into there, usually with one or two rivers. You've got the Hudson's a great example. Um, if you're up looking at the Thousand Islands, you got the St. Lawrence going, obviously out, not in, as as another uh, bay. Um, there's there's numerous. The Mississippi empties in. You know, there's a number of major rivers that uh, probably. I'm not sure what direction that goes, um, but if it empties into, say, the Mediterranean. Um, then sure, I know there's an Nile Delta, so I know there is a place where it enters a body of water. But as I said, my geography is horrid. Um, so which sea it empties into, sadly, I do not know. But it would probably have much the same effect, yes. So the important part here is fresh meeting salt. And in that mix, you've got that brackish water that we talked about. It's not exactly fresh. It's not exactly salt. And as you can imagine, the further you are into the river, the more fresh it is, the further you are into the bay, the more salt it is. And that's how you end up with the stories about sharks, not necessarily alligators coming into upstate New York, but certainly sharks coming up the Hudson or the, uh, what's the one on the other side, the Harlem River? It's the Harlem River. On the other side of, of Manhattan there. Um, it has happened. Um, I mean, I know like where the beach they tell you like don't go too far like that. Like Which beach? Like any beach. Really. Oh well, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, go, like, come back. Like, and sharks can actually, scarily enough, I try not to point this out too often, could come into fairly shallow water. You could be knee deep in water and get attacked by a shark. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I try not to think of that though. Um, so a coastal body of water open to the ocean, but partially surrounded by land, a bay. Uh, characterized by a constant supply of fresh water, which is usually your river, uh, mixing with the ocean's water. And, and um, earlier I, I, I conjugated, uh, I think, benthos into benthic, and you, you corrected me. I wasn't misspelling it. A lot of these words, uh, they use the first three quarters, and they'll put five different endings on it. 
just assume if you see it that it means the same thing. Like I was just about to say estuarine environment. Well, an estuary is a is the noun, and estuarine is kind of like the adjective version. All right. So, um, so an estuarine environment uh, is, a, is, a, is, is a very common, very important. Uh, and as I, okay, so this is just repeating, less saline uh, near the river's mouth, more salinity towards the ocean, and uh, huge uh, biodiversity here, huge uh, production, uh, very fertile because you've got all this stuff washing in off the continent. Um, some you want, some you don't want. Uh, I probably told you guys the story. If not, uh, you're going to hear it now. You might be hearing it again. I did spend some time in Maryland. And um, Maryland, if you don't know, is just a good bit south of you guys, especially if you're in eastern New York. And uh, one of the issues there in the time when I was there was the seagrass was going crazy. And Maryland loves their blue crab. And the blue crab mates, lives, and dies in this uh, area where seagrass tends to grow. But the seagrass was going crazy, and apparently it was throwing off their blue crab population. Somebody did a study, and it was all of the uh, cow poop from upstate New York washing down the rivers and uh, feeding the seagrass, basically. Um, the seagrass was very, very happy. But the uh, the crabs and the Baltimoreans were not so happy. <laughs> so um, so yeah, it uh, it's a very fertile environment. Sometimes too so, too much so. So we recognize um, on land now, the land side, not the water side. We've been talking about salinity and and, and that. Let's go just to the shoreline side now. Uh, we recognize two distinct uh, sort of terrestrial estuary environments, the salt marsh and the mangrove forest. Mangrove forest you've probably seen in movies, if, if nothing Never else. You'll recognize it, though. I bet you. So salt marshes are found in the temperate estuaries, uh, shallow wetlands with salt-tolerant grasses. Again, if you've been to the beach anywhere from the Carolinas on up, um, you've probably seen salt marsh. The tide goes in, the tide goes out. Um, when the tide is in, you've got grasses surrounded by water. When the tide goes out, you're seeing sand and oysters, and then those stands of grasses, okay? And that is a very special kind of plant that can tolerate that much salinity. Try watering some of the plants in your living room with salt water. They're, they're not going to appreciate that. But these guys manage to, to work with it. Mangroves, as the word forest comes after it, these are a really special kind of tree. And as I said, they're, they're fairly recognizable. So here is, Virginia. sorry? Virginia? Yes. How do you say that? Chincoteague. 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 Oh, um, and I've got much better pictures. I don't know why. This must have just been the only one I could find there. But, uh, yeah, this is an old one. But um, so when the water goes out, when the tide goes out, there's going to be a whole lot of mud here exposed. But but you get the idea. Um, this area right here is is all of that vegetation there. And um, if you're not familiar with Chincoteague, it was a uh, subject of a children's book a long, long, long time ago about uh, horses, Misty of Chincoteague. They have wild horses down there in Virginia and the Carolinas. And um, they have evolved if you would, to be able to eat this nasty, salty grass. Um, and because of that, the poor little things retain so much water, they got these giant little be bellies. They're so funny looking. Um, but all that salt acts on them just the way it acts on us, and they, they retain water, which again is probably a good thing to hold on to some extra water when you're out in the wild. But... Um, most things can't can't eat that grass, but they they've they've evolved a way to do so, and like I said, let alone just the crabs and all the oysters that live in that environment, um, and the birds that depend on them, so on and so forth. It's a constant thing to watch the birds um, enjoying when the tide goes out. So there's the mangroves, and what you're used to seeing again, they love to do. Um, if you're watching one of those movies in there and what they call them, a fan boat or whatever, zooming through the Everglades in Florida, 
and you see these big trees with the giant roots sticking out of the water, okay? Um, this is at low tide, presumably. So, uh, which is a good time to take the pictures if you want to show people what a mangrove looks like. Um, so they get these stands of mangroves, and they are, um, again, just a, a salt-tolerant species that uh, has been able to, to make a go of it there. And because they're there, again, that opens up a niche for all the organisms, be it birds. I don't know that you're going to find a whole hell of a lot of small mammals bouncing around in there. But uh, at the very least, uh, birds and, and uh, hello, and stuff like that uh, that are poking around. So again, the lack of soil is, is quite mangrove obvious. So, um, but yeah, that's your mangrove. Uh, forest is pushing it. I'm sure there's areas where there's large enough stands uh, to have uh, maybe qualify as a forest, whole coastline perhaps. But um, but you do tend to see the word stands with mangrove. Talking about a clump of trees. All right. Um, you guys have been, I've been talking for 73 minutes here. You guys have been incredibly patient. Mind you, we've had a lot of digressions and sidetracks, but they were, for the most part, on topic, so that's that's fine, and I, I don't mind that. Uh, if it keeps you guys awake and engaged, then I'm, I'm all for it. But it is time to pause for the day. Um, we will move on. Now, that being said, in the beginning of the semester, uh, we talked about tests. And we told you that you already know the day of test number four, the last day of the semester. The, te the last test of the semester is on the last day of the semester, which, as it turns out, is May 5th. First. I don't know where the fifth came from. May 1st. It's a Wednesday. So we're going to meet, obviously, that last Tuesday, which is April 30th. Now, to fit in a test three, we then need to backdate about halfway through, which, believe it or not, puts us at about next Thursday, which is why I really need you to take test number two, because next week is test number three. Um, test number two again? Huh? Test number two again? Before spring break. Yeah, you did it a while. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to someone else. But so test number three, we are quite likely looking at for next Thursday. OK, just a heads up. Put it on your radar. I like to give you at least a week's notice. We're a week and a couple days at this point. It will be online like all the previous. I will be sitting here like all the previous. A handful of you have been coming and hopefully benefiting from that because you are be able to ask me questions and so on and so forth. Um, and then that will set us up for the last part of the semester. For those of you that have me for lab on Thursdays at 2, uh, we told you last week that Professor Williams will be subbing for me. Um, she wants you guys to meet at the lab room and prepared to go to the creek. Okay, you all have weather apps on your phones. Look at them. Think about all this snow melting and it will probably not be horribly dry. But I almost guarantee you, unless it's lightning, she will take you there. She's a trooper. <laughs> All right. Um, if it were me, I'm like, eh, it's damp and a little cold. I think we'll watch a video of the stream. <clears throat> She'll have you there. So, um, it's, it, it, it beats sitting in lab and, and, and looking in microscopes and stuff. It's a good time, okay? But it, it might not be warm. So dress accordingly, please. Uh, there's going to be crap to carry. Please be helpful, okay? Um, she does supply. We used to supply waiters. I will say that. Um, if you have a pair that you know and love and trust, you might want to bring them. Um, I've heard that ours have various pinholes here and there that occasionally spring a leak. Um, not everyone has to go in the water, but again, the more people that do, the better it'll be. You guys are going to be doing things like taking depth and width measurements. Um, there is a flow meter, which is a, that great big blue pole that's been up on the back cabinet. Uh, you have to hold that in various parts of the stream and see how fast the little propeller goes. You're going to, I don't think you're going to be taking temperature data. You might be. Um, but, uh, and also, as I said, you, you're going to need to get yourselves there. We don't have a shuttle bus. 
So if you have a car, please be kind and give someone else a ride. Um, I'm sure she'll be standing there making sure everybody has a ride. But um, if you can give a ride, give a ride. If you need a ride, don't be sh too shy and not ask for one, okay? You guys are collecting data, and this goes for all the labs, really, but you guys are collecting data for this giant lab report, all right? You're going to be bringing water back to do some lab tests, but this is the other kind of data. This is some physical data, so it's an important lab. All right, I'm going to take attendance, and you guys are free to go.